Lord, we thank you for this beautiful, powerful chapter. We thank you that this chapter is a chapter that should be read in the Christmas season because it shows us why you came. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us, God, as we together lean into this, as we learn from Isaiah, as we learn from these prophetic words, and we remember that they are fulfilled through you, Jesus, we pray, Spirit of God, that right now in this moment we would truly encounter you, that each of us in this moment Each of us wandering wayward sheep at times would be reminded that you go and get us. So have your way, Lord, as we dig into this, as we reflect on the gratitude of peace that you give us. I pray, Lord, that we would walk out today full of gratitude. I pray, Lord, that we would walk out today full of peace peace that is not outside of us, but within. Peace that is not affected by circumstances, but is confessed through faith in you, Jesus. So have your way. We love you, we pray this together in the name of the Father, our Father, in the name of the Son, our Savior, in the name of the Spirit, our great Counselor, we pray. Amen. So we are in the fourth Sunday of Advent. The first Sunday we talked about expectation, in particular, the hope of expectation. The second Sunday we talked about faithfulness and faith and the preparation that we're called in Advent to faith. And last week we talked about joy. We talked about the joy and anticipation of the coming king. And as I was Thinking and praying and reflecting on this and looking at Isaiah and and living in this whole idea of of living in exile, of Advent in exile, I kind of felt like today we needed to remember where we are. Have you ever felt like you forgot where you are? So, So one of the things about me is I am a sleepwalker. Sleep screamer, sleep talker, sleep singer, And I've had these moments before where all of a sudden, I remember one time in middle school, I woke up, I was at this, I was in this uh, program called Awanas, and we were away for a weekend thing, and I remember I, I woke up in a gym full of junior high kids in a place that I didn't go to sleep. And I was surrounded by all these kids. And totally like, like, where am I? And, and I've been feeling a little bit of this, this Advent season. And I think the reason is, is because we believe in Advent that Jesus has come. That the word Advent is about the arrival of the king. But as we look in Isaiah, we're remembering this exile that the people of God were in as they were longing for the arrival of the king. And we live in what I like to call the already not yet reality. As we look at Isaiah, we know that these prophecies, that this this hope and this faith and this peace that is promised, it has come in Jesus. But I think, as I've been wrestling with this in this Christmas season and and trying to really embrace the, the, the Advent spirit of Jesus, would you come back? Would you return? Would you make all things right? I feel like I have focused a little bit too much on the not yet and forgotten the already. The reality of Advent being that Jesus is here, that Jesus is present, that we believe he has come. We aren't waiting for Jesus. The Prince of Peace is here. We aren't waiting for Jesus. The Prince of Peace is here. We believe that in Advent. We believe in the already not yet. We believe in the incarnation when we sing these beautiful, rich carols, when we sing these songs. We believe that Jesus is here through his spirit, that we have access to the Father by the, the work of Jesus. And he is here. 
And I think it can be very easy to get so caught up in the not yet. Jesus, would you come? Jesus, would you, would you, would, would you return and make all things right? We believe that there will be a day when Jesus will return in glory, but in the right now, we are not alone. We have Christ with us by his spirit and dwelling in us. So hope is here. Faith, the object of our faith, Jesus is here. Joy and peace. And today we're talking about peace. I love in the Advent devotional that we've been doing, Jen did the, the opener, Jen Hooker, on, on, the, the, um, on this devotional. And I wanted to quote her. Sorry, Jen, I should ask your permission. I try to do that, but it's okay. You'll forgive me. She wrote this. She said, our meditation this week is on joy. But as we read these verses in Isaiah of the suffering service, we ask, where's the joy? He's despised, disfigured, and acquainted with grief, yet this poem begins with the end. God gives us the end of the story at the beginning. It says he will be exalted. The man of sorrows will be exalted and the lifted high and the whole world will be amazed, but first he must suffer. And as we reflect on gratitude, as we reflect together on, on what it means to truly live in the peace of Christ, there's this important piece of remembering the cost he paid. And so as we ask this question, where are we? As we look at Isaiah 52 through 54, mostly 53, this question of, and this statement that we believe as we read Isaiah 53, that this is where we are. And this, I believe, chapter 53, is the gospel according to Isaiah. This is a gospel message. That we learn in Isaiah 53, the gospel according to Isaiah, this prophetic gospel. And we have these truths in this poem. And I would just encourage you, this week, we can't dig in. I've been at the incredible honor of digging in and, and reading and, 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 and letting it mar marinate. I would invite you this week, would you take some time to read this chapter? To really let the word of God do something in you and to think about the truth. So I wanna highlight what I believe to be four in really important gospel truths for us as we read this chapter of Isaiah 53. And the first, as we think about where we are in this gospel truth is this. Jesus came to bring peace on earth in the most surprising way. Jesus became you, Emmanuel. Jesus became human. Emmanuel, that incredible word, that incredible name that means God with us. We see it prophesied back in Isaiah chapter nine when it says that his name will be called Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. And we see it, we see it revealed here in chapter 52. And, it's, and, and, and we miss the incredible surprise if not the offense of this chapter. The people have been living in exile. They've been waiting for this king who's to come and they're imagining that he's going to come in all glory, in all power. He's gonna take out the Babylonians. He's gonna, it's gonna be like King David all over again. And Isaiah's speaking in and he's talking about this servant that is to come. And this word is probably not a welcome word. It says this. Starting in chapter 52, he writes this. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Like Jen said, this, this, this poem starts at the end. And how is he gonna get lifted up and exalted? As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he be, so, so shall he, he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told, they see. All of a sudden, there's this revelation, and people who didn't even know him will see him. And that which they have not heard, all of a sudden, they will understand. Who writes, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord, this word arm of the Lord, it's this reference to God's salvation, to God's righteousness come. We've been getting pieces of it if you've been reading it in Isaiah and it's saying, who is this going to be revealed? 
How is he going to be revealed? How is salvation, how is righteousness, how is peace going to come? It says this, he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. This is like, almost like a weed coming up, an unexpected source. Since he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Does this not sound familiar? Have we not been singing away in a manger? No beauty that we should desire him. In other words, we're, we, you can easily miss him in the way that he is going to come. As a matter of fact, he was despised and rejected by men. This word for despised, it's a little different in the Hebrew than in the English Translation, it's not so much about this emotion of looking down upon or hating, it's more of just totally overlooking, of seeing him come as a baby or in poverty and having no even chance that this could be the, the servant king. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, Acquainted with grief. When the Son of God comes to us, Emmanuel, he comes to know, to truly understand and have empathy, and to know our grief, our darkness. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus came to bring peace on earth in the most surprising way, Jesus became you, Emmanuel. This is what Christmas is about. It's about incarnation. It's about God taking on skin. I love what um, in John 1, it, 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 Eugene Peterson says, he moves into the neighborhood. This is what is prophesied. It's so surprising. I love one of the, one of the new, newer songs that we've been singing says this, God came to save us, his name is Jesus. The promise was true, the word became you, Emmanuel. This is a part of the gospel. This is a piece of the gospel story that God in his transcendent foreknowledge, in his power, he sent his only son to take on flesh, it's the surprising truth. And so as we think about where we are, we recognize that Jesus came to become human. Second, Jesus came to exchange our chaos for his peace. We call this the great exchange. He came to make this great exchange. Jesus came to be your substitute. To be your substitute, this is a very important piece of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at what it says here. It says, surely he has borne, he has taken on our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was what? Pierced for our transgressions. This word for pierced is to literally be pierced through. Do we, what, what, what is this? Remember, this was written thousands of years before the cross. And yet God in his sovereignty anticipated the cross and the birth of his son. He was crushed for our iniquities. Iniquities is a word for our sins, our trespasses. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. There's this great exchange, this gospel truth of this great exchange. And with his wounds, we are healed. The gospel, it's great, good news. But sometimes we forget that for the gospel to be good news, we need to have this realization that there's some really bad news. And the really bad news is that we, all like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's this problem of sin, we have this problem 
that as we think about our theology and how we think about God, that we do believe that he is a God of grace, that he is a God of love, but he's also a God of holiness and a God of righteousness and a God of justice. And he cannot ignore our sin. We have a hard time with that, but we must hold both hand in hand. This is how, this is the beauty of the gospel. Tim Keller writes about this. He says, on the cross, we see God forgiving us. And that was possible only if God suffered. On the cross, God's love satisfied his own justice by suffering, bearing the penalty of sin. There is never forgiveness without suffering. Nails, thorns, sweat, blood, never. In forgiveness, when someone has sinned against you, there is a price that is to be paid, and there's two options. One is that person pays the price. That person is, there's vengeance, and that person has to pay the price, or the forgiver pays the price, and they say, I forgive you, and I will take on that. This is the truth. This is the truth, and why when Jesus came here on earth, he said, peace, I leave with you, peace, I give to you, not as the world gives it do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. There's this peace, this gospel peace that he gives to us. And we all like sheep have gone astray. It says in Psalms, tells us in Psalms, a psalm that the people of God have been singing for a long time. In Psalm chapter 14, look at what it says here. This isn't on the screen. Just hear this. It says this. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. I was reminded of this. There's this metaphor in Isaiah 53 of a sheep. This past Monday, I got a, I, 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 we got an Instagram message that there was a loose sheep running around Chowchilla that hadn't been collected. And I'm still of the, I, I, I think that Edgar and Gary are in cahoots and they just want their pastor to chase livestock the day after, that, like they just love to have that story, right? So it is, is a long story of going and trying to find this sheep. We find it over by the freeway and we, anyone here ever tried to chase or catch sheep? You've done it by yourself. You've never been successful. We spent all morning trying to figure it out. We, we got the sheep. But as I was reading this passage in Isaiah 53 and just thinking about this truth is, is as we were trying to catch this sheep, as we were trying, we were literally trying to get this sheep home. Now, I love lamb chops, but that wasn't, that wasn't the reason that we were trying to catch this sheep. It was all by itself. It had wandered. It had, it, it had gotten spooked. It had took off. It was by itself. And we knew what was best for this sheep, but the sheep ran from us. And I think as I was reading this and thinking about this, I think oftentimes that we need to remember that we are sheep who have wandered. We are sheep who have a God who goes and wants to get us, and we don't want him to get us. We have times when we wander, when we stray, and, and God goes and gets us in this incredible way. And for some of us, we need to come to grips with our own struggle and our own, and, and the Lord calling to us. And the reality that we are all the sheep in this story. We've all gone astray. And this is where we are. We are the wandering sheep. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are a wandering sheep. Now say back to that person, bah. bah. <laughs> that was immature, I'm sorry, I couldn't do it. <clears throat> As we think about this, we, we recognize that, that, that in this story, Jesus came to be our substitute in, in doctrine and theology, we, we, we call this substitutionary atonement. That we need atonement. That we need something to be paid. And this is where there's this incredible, beautiful reality in this chapter of where we are. And this is so important because we gotta wrestle with some questions that we may have 
about Jesus and about God and about their love and, and why they did it in this way. Is this just divine child abuse? How do we wrestle with this? And I believe this chapter helps us with this. You see, Jesus came, hear this, because he wanted to. Jesus came because God, the triune God, loves you. It wasn't like the father said to the son, hey, you're gonna have to do this. And the son was like, oh, do I have to? Is there any other way? We believe in a triune God, this perfect fellowship, this perfect relationship that, that knows and loves you and me, the wandering sheep. And we see this in Isaiah 53. We see this, that, that when Christ came as a baby, and when he, when he, as he lived here, as he taught here, as he, as he performed miracles, as he taught us about the ways of his kingdom, he always had the, the cross on his mind. That he knew why he was here. Look at what it says here in verse 17 and following. It says this. Verse seven and follow. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You see this in the story, in the gospel stories of who Jesus is. We know that at any time he could have called angels down. At any time he could have he could have tapped out. But yet, we see in this metaphor two metaphors of sheep. One is the wanderer, and one is the submissive. The lamb. It says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. He came. He came because God loves you. Christmas is, it's, it starts with a baby in a manger. It starts with the incredible profound reality of the way that Jesus came. But it is fully revealed in the Son of God dying a horrible, gruesome death on a cross for our sins, bearing our grief, bearing our transgressions, and then resurrecting. John 3, 16 that we read in the Advent lighting today says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus came because God loves you. Do you believe that? Do you live in that? Is that where we are in this moment? And finally, Jesus came to change the world. One heart at a time. Jesus came to get you. He came to get you. Think about this story of, I was thinking about this wandering sheep and, and, and there was this moment, Gary brought in the, the big guns, trying to catch the sheep. In this moment where we were kind of closing in on the sheep, and Gary's driving his truck, and we think we have it, and the sheep does the, like, this, like this crazy move and somehow gets by the truck, and there's the freeway here. And in the entire freeway, I remember, uh, I, there was this little fence, and the fence is great, and then there's this little gap in the fence, and the, the sheep had a chance to, drive, to, to run onto the 99. And luckily, the sheep tried to go through the fence and not over the fence. And I got the incredible privilege of diving on the sheep and catching it. (laughs) 
And in that moment, I, I felt like I was holding the sheep and, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I was so grateful that this was the sheep's story. I was so grateful that this can be our story, that Jesus, when he came to earth, it was to go and get you. That the gospel is not about you getting him. The gospel is not about, about us doing things for him or, or earning his. He goes and gets us. He leaves the 99 to get the one. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. He goes and gets us. I think for some of us, we need to truly embrace and reflect on these powerful gospel truths of Christmas. It says this, it was the will of the Lord. Let this hit you. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. You know that moment when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and he said, Lord, if, if, if you could, if, if, as far as it depends on, on you, if there's any other way, if you could let this cup pass from me, he was talking about this prophecy. But not my will, your will. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offer, offering, offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his lands. Do you see even the hope of the cross? The hope of resurrection that Christ on the cross. It's this prophecy that he would see his offspring. Who are his offspring? Did Jesus have kids? It's the kingdom. It's the kingdom come. It's the king reigning in the hearts of his people. It's Jesus going, dying on a cross, defeating death, saying, death, you have no sting, and now resurrecting. And our savior is by his wounds, his nail-pierced hands, that we are healed. And we live on this side of this. And this is the space that we live in. He goes and gets us. So as we reflect on this in this Christmas season, as we think about peace, as we think about this peace, what better response could we have than gratitude? What better response could you and I have than to be grateful, than to be thankful, than no matter our circumstances, to remember that this is an eternal gift from God our Father that he gives to us, that he gives to you. And so as I was reading this and thinking on this and just letting this truth soak into me, I kind of had this moment where I had to remind myself, this is where we are. Church, we believe this really happened. Church, we believe this is really true, that God really is a triune God, that he really did send his son. And on Christmas, when we celebrate that, we believe it's not a fairy tale. We believe there really was a manger that he was put in, that he really did cry, that he really did have to be cared for by his virgin mother Mary. That he really did live the perfect Life that John the Baptist, when he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that that really happened and that Jesus really did die for you and me and take away the sins of the world. Is this where you are? Is this where you are this Christmas? Are you living in the already but not yet reality? As we think about this, I have two closing things to think about. How do we live in the already? And the first is two words. They don't really go together, but I put them together. And I think one of our responses to this, I would say, is a worshiping wonder. Worship, it's, it's, it's the act of giving God his worth. Wonder, it's, it's, it's this wonder of, oh my goodness, amazing grace. And I think we get this directly from the preceding chapter. Look at what it says here in 54 as it's, as it's writing to God's people. It says, sing, O barren one, who did not bear break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who, who had, have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. It goes on verse verse. Five, or verse four, verse five says, 
For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the earth is called, for the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of the youth when she is cast off, says your God. Worshipful wonder. That's why we sing the songs. That's why we, we show up on, on Christmas Eve and we light the candle and we believe that, that, that the Christ candle is about his very presence and we should be filled with this wonder. And so I would, I would encourage you as you think about how do I live in the already yet, have a question. As you drive home, as you head to your lunch, talk to each other. How can we live with a worshipful wonder this week? How can we give God glory? How can we respond and live in faith to him? Second, a welcomed wanderer. A welcomed wanderer. Remember when we turned to each other and we said that we were all sheep? Let's not forget that. Let's continue to be a people that maybe we need to remember, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave this God I love. But here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And there's something about this wandering that is so beautiful and powerful. And we are invited into this. And we are also invited to believe that God goes and gets the lost sheep. And that word for lost, sometimes I think there's a negative connotation with it. But that word for lost literally means to, to wander from home. To have this longing for home. I love, I was reading this book this week called Unwanted. In the book, he talks about this word for lost, talks about this wandering. It says, in the Heidelberg Catechism, a Protestant confessional document, there is a question about how human beings can know their misery. It's an odd question. Until you understand that the German word for misery is Elend, meaning to be out of one's native land with a deep sense of homesickness. Deep within us is a belovedness that aches to return home. The gospel tells us that our belovedness will never change according to our wanderings, but our belovedness is intended to change our wanderings. I'm not even really sure what that means, but I like it. Our belovedness will never change according to our wandering. God came because he loves you. But our belovedness is intended to change our wanderings. We're home. Wanted to close by just reminding you of this important truth that we see in a New Testament story. You remember in the book of Acts, there's this Ethiopian eunuch. You guys remember this story? He had gone to Jerusalem to learn more and most likely had been rejected. Most likely because he was a eunuch, he had been castrated, he probably wasn't allowed to come into worship. And he has this interaction with a guy named Philip, one of the early disciples. And I just wanted to read this to you as you think about what it means to be a people that are welcoming wanderers. Look at what he says here. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And as he was reading, he was reading the prophet what? Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading. Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless somebody guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scriptures that he was reading was this, hear this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? 
And Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. I believe he said something like this. Jesus changes everything. You're welcomed. He goes and gets you. He loves you. He is your substitute. And I believe that we, beloved, are called to be just like Philip in those conversations, that there are people and we know who Isaiah 53 is about. Let us be a people who are living with this worshipful wonder and a people who live in this posture of welcoming wanderers, fellow wanderers. In a few moments, we're gonna sing a song, Oh Holy Night. And the song can have a feel of being a little dreary, but I wanted to sing it because it's gospel. But I don't wanna leave here dreary. I wanna leave here with gratitude. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that is by letting these words truly do something in our hearts and singing them out together. Singing them out with smiles, singing them out with gratefulness. When it says, fall on your knees, letting our hearts do that work. I'm gonna pray, and I wanna invite you, in response to the gospel of Isaiah 53, beloved, to sing in worship of the Lamb of God who came to take away our sin. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you are the God who brings us peace. We thank you that you came to save us, that, that you came on purpose. And God, we just confess, we recognize that we are prone to wander. And Lord, if there's anybody here that, that maybe they, they can relate to the lost sheep. They've been far from you. They've been trying to earn or they've been wondering if they're welcome. I pray that they hear this today. They're welcome because of you. I pray that we would continue to be a people who confess faith in, in, the, in our God, in our triune God who loves us so much that you would send your son to us. Jesus, I pray as we sing that we would have an awareness that you are here by your spirit. And King Jesus, that you would reign in us and that we would respond appropriately, humble, ready, expectant of your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So have your way, Spirit of God. I pray that you would speak into this space, in this moment. We would encounter the good news of your gospel, that your gospel would just do the things that it does. In your name we pray. Amen.